Hello and welcome everybody. I'll, I will be starting now. As you uh, recognize, we, we are, this is our first session today, so we hope everything is, uh, is, is, is working. And uh, I, my name is Reinhard Busse. I'm one of the co-directors of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. And uh, I'm the director of the summer school which I have designed together with my co-director, Martin McKee, whom you uh, will be meeting uh, in, in, in a few minutes. I um, just thought, because this is the first session here, that I say a few words uh, about, about the summer school, um, whom you are joining from all over the world, as we have already seen in the, in the, in the chat. Um, So the, and you have already seen in the, um, in, in the little movie uh, that the, the summer school is, has been running for, uh, for, for, uh, for 13 years now. And, um, and we have tackled a lot of different, different topics. You have also seen that the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies is a partnership between international organizations such as WHO and the European Commission, national countries and the region of Veneto, which is hosting in normal years a summer school. You see a picture here um, of, the, uh, of the island um, in, in the lagoon of Venice, where we usually meet, you see a group here uh, meeting usually on, on, this, on this island, about 60 people getting together in a very nice atmosphere. We have tackled very different top topics on, on health systems and, uh, and policies. You see, we started with human resources for health. And in 2008, the uh, second year, we already looked at hospitals under the topic of hospital re-engineering and then took a wide scope of, of different topics. And uh, th this, year, this year, we thought we, we come back to the topic of, uh, of, 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 of hospitals. Um, I'm, okay. So I, I hope I'm not too quick and we, um, and, and we designed this topic. So when we planned the summer school last year, we said, um, okay, this is now a bit, bit too late. The, the hospital of the future where patients get appropriate, humane and high quality care and where health professionals would like to, to work. Wait a minute, I now need to go back here. And we had designed a very interesting, um, program. Uh, so Simone, can, can you please go, go back here somehow the, can you please go back to, to the, um, to the topics? No, one more, one more, one more, please. And then I take over again. We were, we, we, we had in mind that hospitals are so important. I will say a few words in, 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 in a minute and so on that we would look onto challenges for the hospital sector, starting by asking ourselves, what is a hospital doing today about the staffing, the technologies, the, the patients, obviously, what are the, the future challenges? How should hospitals uh, look like? How can we make the best use of health professionals, of, uh, of technologies, of, of, of innovations? So that was our plan to go to, to the island and discuss these, these topics. Uh, and then COVID came and we said, um, we, we, COVID is so, so important. And, it, it, and the hospitals are such an important bit of the, of, of, of the challenge of the fight against COVID. So we kept the, the, the hospitals in the topic. And um, I'm now, maybe the next, maybe Simona, you do, you do that. Please, the next slide, please. And so 
we modified it to the topic you have all 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 signed up to the next the next slide please and uh yes so we 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 said we we first of all we we went online now as you notice which has the advantage that people from all over the world can join us which has a disadvantage that we don't have the nice surrounding uh in 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 venice we cut the topics which we had originally in mind short to one week and then next week so this the first week will be this week every day as you have seen in the program uh, starting at 4 p.m and the next week with the exception of monday where we also have a morning session looking at the veneto experience we again meet every afternoon and we discuss uh, the the particular challenges having arisen from the from the COVID uh, crisis. Next slide, please. It's, it's a European, still a European summer school and I just want to present a few data to remind ourselves of the size of the hospital sector within the European uh, Union. So when we look at the European Union 27 member states, we see that we are speaking of, of 1.8 million acute care beds, which is 400 per 100,000 population, but we have huge, huge variations. So if all countries would be like Sweden, we would have half as many hospital beds. If all countries would be as Germany, we would have one and a half times as many hospital beds. The next slide, please. Also to grasp the size of the topic, we are talking, we are talking, talking ab ab about, uh, there was a question including the UK, the question answer is no, this is EU 20, 27 uh, countries. Each hospital bed is, is used for roughly 40 patient, patients. So we are talking about 75 million inpatient cases per year, which is more than the population of France or 500 million inpatient uh, bed days. Next slide, please. Which means that on an average day throughout the year, 1.5 million EU residents spend their bed, uh, spend their day in hospitals, meaning on each individual day, more people than Estonia has inhabitants are, are hospitalized. Next, please. We spent, again, for the EU 27 countries, we spent 1.3 billion euro each day on our hospitals, uh, which, uh, which, which is 1,000 euro per EU uh, resident per year, which is 37% of total health expenditure or 3.7% of our combined gross domestic product. For comparison, I put there what we spent uh, on education together. So this is, this is a complete education expenditure, which is only slightly uh, more than on, than on hospitals, just to realize the, the, again, the size of the, of the sector. The next, please. And last but not least, and we will be also talking about this, it's a major source of employment. So within the EU countries, we have 1.8 million nurses working in the hospitals. We have 800,000 million physicians working in the hospital sector. All these data are based on full-time equivalents. And this will lead to many questions which we will be addressing over this week and the next week. Is this enough or is it too many? Is it the correct mix? What about the, the, the patient needs? And we will look at this both before the, the, the COVID crisis, during and after. What does this mean for the, uh, for, for, for the future? So I was just 
showing you brief overview. There is also, and you have already seen that on the video, a new book which, which came out on the topic of the summer school. Martin McKee is the, uh, the first editor of this, of this book. You can download this and I guess the, uh, the lecturers in the first week will refer also to, 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 to the chapters where you can read more stuff. I will be now handing over to my co-director, Martin McKee. But before I do that, I want to say we have a Twitter. Please go to the, you can Twitter on, on this uh, event. And, uh, and, and we have a chat. Many of you have already used the chat. You can put things in the chat and we have questions and answers. So after the, 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 the lecture, you can, you can address questions to the lecturers and I will be managing this process. Over to you, Martin. Thank you very much indeed, Reinhardt, for your introduction. And can I add my welcome to yours to, to welcome everyone to our summer school. This is very different from the way that we normally do it. And uh, it is uh, likely that we will have some teething problems. So I hope that you will bear with us. What we're going to do now is that uh, I'm going to speak for a little over 30 minutes. And uh, someone is asking, can you uh, give a link for the book? Uh, yes, uh, we can. Um, and I'll be speaking for a little over 30 minutes and I'll be giving a broad overview of what we cover in the book. Uh, the uh, book is available to be downloaded freely from the observatory website, uh, so you can actually get it there. Uh, you can get it now, in fact. And uh, I'll be, as I say, going through the different chapters and, and picking out some ideas from the different parts of it. And then I'm going to be followed by one of the lead authors in one of the chapters, uh, David Oliver, who's a consultant in geriatric medicine and a uh, former president of the British Geriatric Society and a real uh, expert in frailty among older people and the challenges in hospitals. So at this stage, I'm going to stop talking because my presentation has been pre-recorded and Annalisa, I think, is now going to take over and press some buttons to allow you to watch that. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this session on the hospital of the future. This is one of the key themes of the observatory's summer school this year. And then the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to be looking at the ways in which the hospital is changing and what it means for those who are responsible for the services provided in hospitals, for the organization of hospitals and for the health system more generally. Hospitals have been around for a very long time. This hospital in Siena in Italy opened in the 12th century and it continued to be used right up to the 20th century. During that time, it changed relatively little until recent years. And of course, hospitals have often remained remarkably resistant to change over time. But that's all changing now. And we're seeing a remarkable pace of technological change, of organizational change, of the ways in which we work. The problem is that we're often doing that in facilities that themselves are difficult to change. This is a hospital that was in operation for over 100 years. And clearly it was possible to do something with the redesign, moving things around but it's built out of bricks and concrete, and there's a limit to what you can do in facilities that were designed um, so long ago. Let's just think back to the origins of the modern hospital in the 19th century. The reason that we created the modern hospital was essentially due to scientific and educational advances. The first advance was the discovery of x-rays and radiation by the Curies, advances in physics, and that led to the development of x-rays and scanners, and more recently, ultrasound and other forms of imaging. And then there were advances in chemistry. Remember that in the 17th and 18th century, if a physician wanted to know what was in urine, for example, if there was sugar, 
they would taste it rather than taking it to a laboratory to be tested. So we've had all sorts of advances in what can be done in laboratories. And similarly with biology, the discovery of germs by Louis Pasteur had led to the uh, growth of modern microbiology. All of this led to a revolution in scientific medicine. And with that was the need for physicians, nurses, and other health professionals who were trained to understand these scientific advances. They could not be trained by the old form of apprenticeship where they might follow a country doctor around on their, on their rounds, watching how they treated patients in their homes. It was necessary to bring them together into the teaching hospitals. So all of these advances together, coupled with the development of anesthesia and of asepsis so that people could be operated on without them dying from infection, led to the concentration of resources and the creation of the modern hospital as we know it. In the session today, I'm going to be following the outline of our new book. You can download it from the observatory's website and we will be going through the different uh, types of services that hospitals are providing and looking at what this means for the future. We'll be looking at children, older people, patients with stroke, chronic airways disease, cancer. We'll be looking at the management of emergencies and we'll be looking at services that support all of these treatments, perioperative medicine, imaging, laboratory medicine, and then we'll try and pull it all together. But I do hope that you will download the book and I hope that you will find what we have got in there, put in there interesting. So why do we need to change the way the hospital works? Well, there are at least three reasons why we need to do things differently. The first is that hospitals are treating different patients. Populations are getting older. Now, of course, they're getting older and fitter, but they still are getting older. And with that, you have increasing frailty and increasingly multimorbidity. This is a success of modern medicine. From the 1960s onwards, we've been introducing new medicines, blockbuster drugs, the beta blockers, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, bronchodilators, treatments that have allowed people with chronic airways disease or hypertension or heart failure or Parkinson's disease or mental illness to remain in good health, but only by taking one or two or three or four drugs every day. And some of these drugs interact with each other. And as people get older, we have to take account of the fact that their liver or their kidney may not be working as well. And all of these pose major challenges in terms of the complexity of their conditions. We have different diseases. We have new infections. And of course, the one that we're thinking of at the minute and we'll come back to later is COVID. But 40 years ago, we had the advent of HIV. We have antibiotic resistant bacteria, MRSA. We have new subgroups of existing diseases. In the 1920s, with the advent of insulin, people started talking about type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Now, with cancer and our ability to characterize the molecular basis of different cancers, we are dividing what we used to label as, for example, breast cancer into different types of disease, depending on hormone receptors, depending on cell types, depending on all sorts of other things. And we have the disappearance of old diseases, particularly many of the infectious diseases. Although, of course, we can never be sure that they're completely gone with the notable exception of smallpox. And we have new ways of treating patients. We have molecular targeting, drugs that, uh, you know, the cancer drugs in the past were essentially derived from chemical warfare agents. They zapped all of the cells that were rapidly reproducing. But now we can target individual molecules. We're seeing that with COVID, for example, with drugs that are targeted to different parts of the virus. We've got short-acting anesthetics, which has transformed 
the surgeries that we can do. No longer do patients need many hours to recover from an inhalational anesthetic. And that makes it possible to offer procedures on a day basis. People come into hospital for a few hours to have what would once have been considered a very major procedure undertaken. We have interventional radiology. In many cases, we no longer have to cut into the abdomen or the thorax to get to the organs. We can go through the blood vessels. We can go through the gastrointestinal tract. We can go through uh, the abdominal wall uh, with uh, all sorts of techniques, uh, with probes which are linked to ra uh, radio radiological imaging. And again, this has had brought about major changes in the way that we're treating patients. Minimally invasive surgery, the same, and much else. So for all of these reasons, the treatments that we are providing for patients, the diseases that we're treating, and the nature of the patients themselves are all changing. And that has huge implications for the hospital. And then we can add some other things that are changing. New professional roles. We'll talk much more later in the week about task shifting. Who should do different jobs within the hospital and beyond it? The rise of automation, new types of equipment, robotic surgery, microprocessors, um, automated laboratory equipment, point of um, care uh, diagnostics. And we have new models of care. We'll talk a lot about multidisciplinary teams, but not just multidisciplinary teams with physicians and nurses and therapists, but multi-specialty teams with experts in the lungs and the cardiovascular system, surgeons, physicians, working together, oncologists and others, to deal with the increasing complexity of modern medicine. And we have new systems of accountability, patient reported outcome measures, patient reported experience measures. We are now listening to the patients, or at least we should be listening to them, in ways that we did not do before. We have regional and national audits, so that we can compare the quality of our practice with our colleagues elsewhere. And that information is now being reported to the public so they can assess where they want to be treated and by. Looking wider, we can see that the hospital is now a major setting for research. Clinical trials, for example, are now routine. We should hope that anyone with any of the cancers for which we do not yet have a treatment should be entered into a trial if there is a candidate drug. One of the great successes we've seen, we'll again talk about this later in the week, has been how in the country I live in, in the United Kingdom, a very high proportion of patients with COVID who are admitted to hospital are entered into one of a series of clinical trials. But it's not just clinical trials that are adding to our knowledge. Organizational research is making a huge contribution where we can look at different ways of doing things, different ways of team working, different ways of organizing our time, different settings for care. We also increasingly recognize the hospital as an economic driver. Hospitals can play a huge role in regional development. They're often one of the largest employers in towns and cities increasingly along with universities, as we see the decline of traditional manufacturing industry. But the teaching hospitals, the university hospitals, are part of the medical industrial complex, working with the pharmaceutical and the health technology industries to develop new treatments, new diagnostics. The hospital does not exist in isolation. It is part of a much wider health system landscape. And so we're now seeing the importance of the hospital linking in with primary care and with social care, ensuring that patients who are discharged from hospital, especially if they're frail and have complex conditions, have somewhere to go and someone to look after them. They've always been a setting for education, but we're now finding new ways of doing that, particularly as patients spend shorter times in hospital and we look at innovations in teaching and ambulatory care, but also teaching using simulators, using robotics, all sorts of imaginative ways uh, of, tra of training the next generation of health professionals. And finally, 
we need to look at the hospital in the broader environment, greening the hospital. Hospitals are a major source of pollution. Think of all those single-use plastics in personal protective equipment that, is thrown, that are thrown away. But also look at where we put our hospitals. Are we generating greenhouse gases by people having to drive to the hospitals? Do we have good public transport links? Many other questions that we need. I'm now going to start by talking about children. Hopefully, if you have a child, they never have to go to a hospital except perhaps to be born. But if they are unfortunate to go into hospital, they'll see something that would have been unimaginable to people of my generation. I can remember when I was a medical student, we still had fever hospitals, wards that were full of children with respiratory infections, gastrointestinal infections, infectious hepatitis and the like. Thankfully, those have largely disappeared. But in their place, we now have the growth of chronic conditions, such as type 1 diabetes in children. In some cases, where we have high levels of childhood obesity, we even have type 2 diabetes. Genetic disorders. We are now able to characterize many of the inborn errors of metabolism in a way that we could never have imagined before, and to find ways to keep those children alive. Unfortunately, we're seeing a growing burden of mental illness in ch children and adolescents, which is placing or creating challenges for our hospitals and for our community services. And childhood cancer is now treatable. Many of the most successful treatments in cancer are for children, thankfully, but that is changing all the time. Sometimes children have emergencies, poisonings, injuries, swallowing things and so on. And again, the hospital has a role to play. And of course, with the increasing survival of babies at very low birth weight, we have neonatal intensive care. So we can see in all of these ways, what once was a single specialty of pediatrics has changed beyond all recognition with a huge amount of specialization. We cannot expect a physician, a pediatrician who is an expert in child and adolescent mental health to also cover neonatal intensive care. These are quite different areas. And that has implications for the way in which we provide for children. One of the questions we have to answer is whether children should be in hospital at all. Well, of course, sometimes they do have to be. Sometimes they're born in hospital and they immediately need care. So we have neonatal intensive care units. Now that has implications for where babies are delivered. Many mothers perfectly reasonably would like to have their children at home in familiar circumstances. However, which that is fine providing everything goes well, but sometimes it won't. Now there's an issue about home births versus hospital births, which I'm sure we can discuss in the questions and answers. But what this does mean is that it has implications for the configuration of hospitals covering a geographical area. You cannot have a neonatal intensive care unit everywhere, and particularly in border areas or where you have sparse populations, you need to think through what the implications will be. Lots of interesting challenges there. Emergency departments we'll come back to later, but this, they, these are really not places where we would want children to be. But if children are going to be there, then they need to have access to appropriate specialists in orthopedics, surgery and ophthalmology and so on. And again, this creates significant challenges for the way in which we organize our services. As with neonatal intensive care units, the numbers are small, they fluctuate and, have, and this has a huge implication for the configuration of services. I just want to, to touch on a few areas where paediatrics is developing. Paediatric oncology, for example. The paediatricians among you will know this saying very well. Children are not just small adults. They differ in terms of their physiology. They differ in terms of their emotions. They differ in many ways from adults and they need services that are tailored to their needs. 
Some cancers, which are rare in adults, are often even rarer in children. Some cancers are only found in children. Some other cancers are never found in children. Particularly when you're dealing with rare diseases, you may need to engage in international collaboration, especially if you're in a small country. There may not be the possibility to develop enough expertise within a single country. And something we'll come back to again and again throughout this session. Treatment is a team effort. But of course, the child should be at the heart of the team, supported by their family and by the healthcare staff. Always the children should be at the centre. And finally, and sadly, we need to accept that treatment does not always work. And sometimes we will need to provide palliative care for children. Unfortunately, in a number of countries, palliative care is not well developed even for adults, but it's even less well developed for children. Then we have the management of chronic diseases. Hopefully, most of this, most of this will be done in the ambulatory care setting, but often this will be linked to specialists in the hospital. This is hugely complicated because as the parents are looking after their child, They'll be watching that child grow, going through all the normal physiological changes and emotional changes that any child does. But how will they know what's normal and how will they know what's not? We have described a phenomenon of parallel vigilance, typically with children with type 1 diabetes. Are their problems just growing up or are they due to the diabetes? This is a real challenge and this is where Working with other parents with children with the same condition can be hugely helpful, but it really does require specialists and services within hospitals that are really well attuned to their needs. And of course, children with chronic diseases can easily suffer as a result of losing out on education. So we need to have very close relationships with educational providers. Finally, we need to recognise the challenges of stigma and isolation facing many of these children. Children have rights, patients have rights, but we need to recognise the particular rights of the child. And when we're creating a hospital facility for children, again, they're not just small adults. We need to recognise that they should be welcomed by friendly staff, ideally staff that they know and recognise. We need to explain to them what is going to be done to them and when. They have a right to know. We shouldn't be talking over their heads. They should have the option to be accompanied by their parents and relatives. But as they grow older, they may not want to choose that option. The choice is always theirs. And like everybody, they have the right to be treated according to evidence-based medicine. Itself a challenge because often we will find that the clinical trials of the drugs that we're administering have never been done on children. They should experience as little pain as possible, again true for everyone, but particularly for children. But the treatment that they should receive should be appropriate to their age and their condition. Staff need to be trained how to communicate with children and with their parents. It's not easy particularly with young children. And children should be able to experience a private and respectful atmosphere whenever possible. I'm now going to move to the other end of the age spectrum to talk about acute medicine and in particular stroke, one of the two examples that we deal with in the book. When I was training many years ago, patients with stroke were admitted to hospital and were put to bed. We had very little other treatment for them other than to try to keep them alive. But that has changed beyond all recognition. Now we will have early imaging to find out if their stroke is due to a blood clot or due to a bleed. And there will be measures taken to, if possible, reperfuse their brain. We can use thrombolysis if they have a clot. That needs to be done within about four and a half hours of the onset of the uh, of the stroke. Or we can do thrombectomy if they have a clot, removing the blood clot from the artery. 
but this we had can do within six hours. But clearly, if we're going to do this, then the patients need to get to highly specialized care early. We cannot leave them lying around in emergency departments. They should be, everyone should know to recognize the symptoms, to seek care early, but once they get to hospital, they need to be moved rapidly through the system. And that requires a high level of organization. It doesn't just happen on itself. Once they get into hospital and once they're treated, we need to remember the other end of the treatment. What happens after they leave? We need to try to reduce the prospect that they'll have another stroke, which many patients will do if they've survived the first one. So it's not just a matter of treating the acute phase, it's making sure that we have secondary prevention in place, antiplatelet therapy, anticoagulation, lowering of blood pressure. And of course, if they have lost power or speech or um, other functions, then we need to put a major emphasis into rehabilitation. Working as a multidisciplinary team with physiotherapy, speech and language therapy, and going beyond the hospital, looking at their home environment and putting in place appropriate uh, support at home, working with occupational therapists. Very much a team effort. One of the things we find is that one of the best ways of doing this is to have comprehensive stroke centres. All patients now suffering a stroke in a geographical area should be taken to a specialised stroke unit. There, they can get advanced imaging and invent interventional neuroradiology 24 hours a day, seven days a week. One example where this has been done and where it has been remarkably successful was London. In 2010, there were 28 centres providing care for people with acute strokes. That was reduced to eight centres, each serving a population of between one and one and a half million people. And it was shown that that was associated with a much faster reduction in case fatality than in other English cities. Looking ahead, and in some places even to the present, we're seeing brain imaging being undertaken in ambulances, as in Berlin. We're looking at stem cell technology for brain injury. We're looking at the use of robotics to support rehabilitation. And we're looking at integrated care pathways from the onset of stroke all the way through to rehabilitation. The second medical condition we look at in the book is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And here we're seeing the same general concepts as with stroke. We are seeing the importance of early recognition. Now, this is a chronic condition rather than an acute condition, but trying to anticipate the disease by working with patients who are at risk, smoking cessation, for example, exercise therapy and so on, to help them to prevent the decline in their lung function. Um, and then once they have developed that condi the condition, pulmonary re rehabilitation, social care and so on, to help them to improve their lung function and also to reduce the scope for exacerbation of the disease. Again, we have some good examples. So another example from London, an integrated respiratory team at King's Health Partners in South London, a programme that brings together people inside hospital and outside, bridging the hospital and the community, providing oxygen, pulmonary rehabilitation and other support for people living at home. But with a single point of referral, should they become ill and have an exacerbation of their disease? Specialists provide virtual clinics in primary care settings so the patients do not have to come and wait in hospitals. And that's been associated with a 34% reduction in admissions and a 17% reduction in length of stay for those who do come to hospital. But there are other projects from across Europe. Post-acute care with early supported discharge for selected patients linked to support in the community. The Nexus project in Spain where you have remote monitoring, a health coach providing support via a video link. And that too has been associated with a significant reduction in admissions. The sixth project in Denmark, um, interventions lasting seven to 12 weeks with disease specific education, physical training, nutritional advice, and smoking cessation, and again, a reduction in admissions. And what we're seeing in all of these examples is 
care in the hospital that reaches out into the community, both before patients come into hospital and after they come into hospital, ideally to prevent them coming into hospital in the first place and to support them on their return to home. Another area we're going to talk about, and we do discuss in the book, is frail older people. I'm not going to talk about it now because in the next session, David Oliver, one of the lead authors in that chapter and one of the leading authorities on frailty in older people and a regular correspondent to the British Medical Journal, will be presenting and will be providing his insights on the challenges that we face. So I'll leave that to David. I know I want to talk to cancer about cancer. Cancer is complex. This is a logic model that we developed in a new recently published paper where we look at the pathways that are followed by cancer patients all the way through the system from onset of disease through screening and early diagnosis and into the hospital and then into post hospital care survivorship. The hospital itself is this bit in the red box in the center. But you can see very clearly here that that is only one part of the overall system. That will not work if any of the other bits don't work. And the other bits include making sure you've got the resources, the training of specialist staff, the development of new medicines, uh, the development of team working, the linkage to the community, and the linkage when things go wrong to palliative care. I've just magnified up the bit in the hospital here. And again, even within the hospital, you can see the complexity. Some of the elements are not specific to cancer, communication, infrastructure, training, systems for quality assurance, clinical research are all important. But look at the different groups of staff that we need. We need oncologists, radiographers, surgeons, nurses, other clinicians. And we need other members of the multidisciplinary team, physiotherapy, dietitians, and others. And we need laboratory staff, imaging staff, and others, all coming together to support the patient on their journey. Some of the developments that are influencing the role of the hospital include new models of care. Some of these are driven by the technology, precision medicine, targeted therapies, immunotherapy, where we have molecules being individually targeted by antibodies, for example. And one of the more unusual versions that we're now seeing is what we call nanobodies. I just mentioned that because it's something that's being looked at in COVID. One of the problems with um, the typical antibodies is that the molecules are very large, but we've discovered that camels, llamas, alpacas have antibodies that are much smaller and uh, that are now being used. So we're finding solutions in some of the strangest of places. Image guided interventions, we'll talk later about radiology, interventional radiology, survivorship care, palliative care, and above all, patient empowerment now becoming key. Cancer, like any chronic condition, involves the shared management by the patient and the healthcare provider and the patient is often an expert in their own condition. But we have a lot of organizational developments. We need networks because with this super specialization, nobody can be an expert in everything. And with some cancers, we may only have a relatively small number of patients even in the largest of countries. Now we'll be hearing later in the summer school about the European reference networks, which provide an opportunity to bring together expertise across borders. But these networks can work in areas like advanced diagnostics, molecular pathology, genetic sequencing. Another organizational development are patient registries. Cancer registries, of course, have a long history and they are absolutely invaluable, but even now we have many parts of Europe that are not adequately covered, or if they are, the information is not as good as it might be, and we don't have all of the linkage that we need all the way through from the onset of cancer through to survivorship. And I now want to say a bit about emergency medicine. Emergency medicine is a specialty that is time critical. 
Again, a message that we're seeing more and more as we talk about the hospital is that it's not just what goes on inside the walls, but the best emergency medicine, the most innovative emergency medicine, encompasses the pre-hospital stage and then the triage, the sorting of patients in hospital, as well as the resuscitation, the initial assessment, the management of patients until they're transferred to elsewhere, all the bits that we know about. We're simplifying here, but there are different models of care. Some countries have an anaesthetist-led service. The anaesthetists and the resuscitation staff treat the patients early, and they then go to individual specialists, orthopedic surgeons, or ophthalmologists, or general surgeons, trauma surgeons. Then we have what we call the Anglo-Saxon model, often seen in the English-speaking countries, where you may have initial care by paramedics, and people are then brought into an emergency department, and you have specialist emergency uh, physicians in their own right. That is a specialism that is recognized as such, which covers the whole range of work in the emergency department. Both have got strengths, both have got weaknesses, and of course, a lot of it depends on wider characteristics. Well, emergency medicine is first and foremost a matter of sorting people out. People come into the emergency department in all sorts of different ways. They may be referred from primary care. They may be come in, coming in in ambulances. They may come in on their own. And they all get mixed up. And that's where, if we had one of Harry Potter's sorting hats from Hogwarts, it would be much easier, but we don't. So we need to have a complex system to sort them out. Who needs to go home after treatment, or even without treatment? Who needs to be admitted to hospital? Who needs to go elsewhere? And increasingly, what we're finding is that there are people who need to go elsewhere. And that's the really challenging bit, because, of course, those systems need to be in place, and we need to have good systems of Some countries have developed medical assessment units. These are typically for people with chronic conditions that have exacerbations or new onset but of conditions with uncertain diagnosis. For example, patients where you're not sure if they have got a myocardial infarction or not. And often this is heavily driven by protocols. So a patient will have a syndrome, a set of, condition, of symptoms. They'll be brought in and they will go through a highly structured clinical pathway until you have a definitive diagnosis. Many, much of this care in some countries is being provided not by physicians, but by nurses supported by other therapists. And the pathways are related not um, to the, uh, are, are often a, a determined by the acuity, the uh, nursing intensity uh, or that they require, uh, the degree of support that they need um, once they've had the initial diagnosis. I've already mentioned that children really should not be in an emergency department. The scenes that they see or would see are often horrific. The behavior that they will encounter, particularly if you have problems with drunken patients, are going to be horrific as well. And so therefore, ideally, ideally we would manage them somewhere else. At least if they are going to be in an emergency department, there should be special facilities for children to protect them from everything else that is going on. We're seeing again, as with so many other aspects of hospital work, working beyond the hospital. One example is what's called street triage. Many emergency departments have lots of patients with common mental disorders, with acute um, episodes of mental illness. One approach that's been tried in some places is street triage, where a vehicle, an ambulance, will go to, pe to uh, people's homes or to the street, um, where you have police, ambulance staff, and mental health cl clinicians working together as a team in partnership. Other possibilities are having social workers in emergency departments, particularly for those people who are coming in repeatedly, who often are coming in not because they need the medical treatment as such, or even if they do need medical treatment, their exacerbations are due to problems in their lives, which can be addressed by tackling their social problems. Both of these measures have been associated with reduced uh, admissions to hospital. 
One of my favourite examples is from Cardiff in Wales. Jonathan Shepherd, a maxillofacial surgeon, has done remarkable work with the police and with social services, mapping violent hotspots and then working with the police and the criminal justice system um, and working with um, the, the hospitality industry, for example, by bringing in shatterproof glasses. Um, and that work over many years has led to a sustained reduction in hospital admissions following violence, much more so than in other cities in the United Kingdom. I want to say a few words about perioperative medicine, anaesthetics and surgery for patients undergoing urgent or non-urgent surgery. In the old days, a patient would have come into hospital and they would have seen the anaesthetist the day before the operation or even on the morning of the operation. Now, in many cases, that will still be appropriate. But we have to remember that with older and frailer patients, that may no longer be appropriate. And so we see this as a journey, not as an episode. A patient who is referred from primary care for surgery should be checked out to see if they have other problems that need to be addressed, particularly if they have chronic medical conditions, if they have frailty, if they have other disorders that need attention. And that's an opportunity for a full preoperative assessment. And also what we call shared decision making will come back to a discussion with the patient as to whether surgery is actually the right option because there are always risks and benefits and individuals will value those risks and benefits in different ways. So it's important that the patient themselves make up their mind as to whether they want to undergo the treatment and when and if there are different ways of having it, which way. Then of course there's the surgery, but the, again we should not think that that's the end of the matter because again, particularly with older patients and with multimorbidity, we need to recognise the importance of frailty and we need the, to recognise the importance of supporting them with early recovery and rehabilitation. And finally, discharge with multidisciplinary follow up if that is needed. Some of the innovations that we have seen in hospitals with older patients, an example again, I'm sorry, I'm using all these examples from London, proactive care of older people undergoing surgery, the POPS project where you have a geriatrician, a physician specialising in the care of older people, leading a multidisciplinary team that has anaesthetists and surgeons, social workers and nurses. They identify the risk factors and um, they work with the patient, their family and their carers. And that's been associated with significant reductions in complications and in hospital stays. We talk about rehabilitation. But what about prehabilitation? Patients should never be operated on if they're smoking. But of course, many patients still do, even though numbers are coming down in, many, in all countries. But if they do smoke, then we should be seeing them before non-urgent surgery and doing everything possible to get them off cigarettes, ideally forever, but at least for the duration of their treat of their surgery. That will reduce their risk of chest infections and it will improve their wound healing. It will be much better all around. Exercise therapy, again to make them fitter for the surgeon surgery. I mentioned shared decision making. Lots of instruments are now available. Um, there are uh, there are video um, programs that patients can interact with. They can ask questions. They can look at the different choices. They can hear the experiences of patients who have had treatment before. And finally, they can decide what they want to do, what treatment is most appropriate for them. This is an example called Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. And it shows some of the things that can be done in the, peri the preoperative period pre-admission counselling, making sure that people have adequate fluids and carbohydrates, um, looking at uh, whether or not they need bowel preparation or antibiotic prophylaxis, thromboprophylaxis in many patients. And then the, the, the intraoperative care, I've already mentioned short-acting anaesthetic agents from which patients will recover much more quickly. Local and regional anaesthetics, 
reducing the number of surgical drains, being very careful with fluid overload, making sure that patients are kept warm. And, peri and post operative care, again, uh, avoiding nasogastric tubes, work to prevent nausea and vomiting, early mobilization, and other measures. And with this care, very, this much more intensified care to the patient before they have surgery, during their surgery, and after surgery, you can reduce the risk of complications, reduce the length of stay, and generally improve everything for both the for the hospital, for the staff, and above all for. The I'm moving on to the final two areas, the support services, imaging. In the old days, we were limited to essentially plain x-rays, maybe with some contrast, barium meals, barium enemas, that sort of thing. The situation has changed beyond all recognition. Now, it's very rare for an x-ray on um, standard photographic film to be developed. It's done um, automatically as digital images. And those digital images can then be read by people anywhere. Uh, so for example, in a number of European hospitals, the x-rays and the images that are taken at night can be read by people in Australia or New Zealand during their working hours. It allows you to have super specialization where you can have a small number of people who are experts in a part, particular part of the body in a few places in the country who can then review the images. We're finding new ways of bringing together different types of imaging combining computerized tomography, magnetic res resonance imaging, for example, with positron emission emitting radiopharmaceuticals. It's a bit like the old ideas of the barium mills and so on, but much more sophisticated. And a huge area, but developing at different paces in different countries, partly because in some countries these things are done by surgeons, in some cases by radiologists, but it's the area of interventional radiology. Stenting for aortic aneurysms, embolization for bleeding from organs, gastrointestinal hemorrhage, renal hemorrhage, postpartum hemorrhage, thrombolysis and thrombectomy for stroke going into the carotid arteries, relief of renal obstruction going up through the ureter, and then targeted radio or chemotherapy for cancer using, using x-ray guided probes to get into the tumor and to perhaps leave bits of radioisotopes in there or uh, some other form of uh, targeted chemotherapy. But what this means again, a theme that's coming out again and again in all of this is the importance of multidisciplinary teams. And here we're seeing the role of radiologists, and laboratory physicians and others working with surgeons, pediatricians, gynecologists, physicians, um, all sorts of other people. And the, the support services that might once have been in, a, in an x-ray department or a laboratory are now very much part of the team on the ward with the other. Laboratory medicine has seen an unparalleled uh, pace of progress. Advances in genomics, proteomics, uh, metabolomics, mass spectr uh, spectrometry, microarrays, self-testing near patient testing, wearable IT, um, biosensors, people are be able to monitor their blood sugar in real time. And this is, of course, leading to um, uh, all sorts of ways in which we can track the patient's physiological param parameters in real time. Linked to that, we're seeing the laboratory staff getting out of the laboratory, working in integrated models of care with clinicians, um, with radiology departments and others. We're seeing a huge amount of subspecialization with highly specialized expertise um, going right down to individual molecules. Some division of time and resources into hot and cold laboratories, the hot ones that are required for the urgent work some of which, of course, is being overtaken by near patient testing, and the cold laboratories that can operate much more as factories on production lines. And like with radiology, we're seeing advances in digital technology, allowing an image to be, for, for example, of a microscope slide to be interpreted by somebody in a different continent. So pathology is having an impact in all sorts of areas. 
in screening, in diagnostics, and increasingly in the long-term monitoring of people after they've had their treatment, people with chronic diseases, people with cancers, and so on. And they're interacting with a whole range of different medical specialties, children, young people, um, people who are uh, physicians and nurses who are providing acute care, uh, non-urgent care, mental, illness, mental health care, and uh, of course, the end of life care. Uh, again, coming back to this point about. So where do we go to in the future? Well, this is a quotation I frequently use from Donald Rumsfeld. There are no unknowns. There are the things we know we know, but there are also the known unknowns. That is, there are some things that we don't know, but we know that they're there. The problem is that the things that we don't know about and which um, and we don't know if they're going to happen. Now, we could take the current COVID epidemic. Now, obviously, nobody knew that it would be the particular um, COVID-19, uh, but we were pretty sure that there would be a pandemic at some stage. The tragedy, of course, as we'll talk about later, is that we didn't really plan very well for it. But what does it mean for the hospital? Well, I've talked about the technological advances, the new medicines, the new diagnostics, the new treatments. I've talked about the organizational advances. I've talked about the super specialization and the need to manage multimorbidity. What we're seeing is a combination of incremental and disruptive change. Some things are just moving gradually. So for example, with interventional radiology, we're seeing more and more opportunities to intervene techniques for embolization that might once have been used for um, stopping bleeding from a kidney, for example, moved into the gastrointestinal tract, have moved into the carotid arteries. And other things are really revolutionary changes. Throughout this, we've seen an awful lot of talk about team working, working together across disciplines, across specialties. Task shifting is part of this. Who is the best person to do the job? And we've talked a little bit about the hospital in the health system and in the wider society. We will have a separate session on task shifting in which my colleague May Van Skulvig will be describing some work that we've been doing recently, in particular a major report for the European Commission's expert panel on investing in health. But task shifting is often misunderstood. It's often thought of as a way of getting someone to do a job, but do it cheaper by delegating it. It's much more complicated than that because we now know that some things should be shifted to people who actually have higher levels of skills. Some, some tasks should be shifted to people who have different skills. So within the healthcare workforce, we'll be hearing about examples of shifting tasks between doctors and nurses and pharmacists and therapists between each other and in both directions. But task shifting is much more than that. Task shifting involves shifting roles between health professionals and between pa and patients and their carers, again going in both directions. And not just with humans, but with machines, with the advances in information technology, with new apps, biosensors, and so on. Again, we're seeing a shift from health professionals and from patients and carers to machines. And of course, when we come to the unknown unknowns, 19, or 2020, the year that everything changed, COVID, this is something that we'll be talking about as we go through the rest of the summer school. And this is something that really highlights why the hospital needs to be flexible, why we need to be able to adapt, why we need to embed research within clinical practice, why we need to have that flexibility that is allowed by task shifting, and why hospitals will always have to change because we'll never know when the next COVID is going to come along. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you very much. 
and I'm hoping that you can see and hear me because I can't see myself on the screen. But on the assumption that you can, what I'm going to do is to go straight to introducing David. I've already said something about him, a consultant in geriatric medicine, former president of the British Geriatric Society, and he's already been introduced a bit in my talk. David, over to you. Okay. Uh, hopefully the sound quality is okay. Um, I should just say to people, at one point during Martin's talk, my connection went down and I got back quickly. So if I vanish again, I will try and get back online as quickly as I can. So don't uh, panic. Uh, do we have the slides so that I can see them? Thank you. Um, just let me know if I'm, if I'm controlling the slides now. Thank you. Okay. So I am primarily an acute hospital doctor in the UK. I'm sitting now in an 800 bed hospital, having just seen about 30 people uh, on a ward round. So acute hospital care of frail older people is very much my, um, my core business. Now, before I go on, I'm just hoping that, I'm waiting for, there we go, for the slides to uh, become clearer. I have not focused on lots of data or graphs or references in my talk because I would rather talk about some generic challenges um, around hospital care for older people, but I will highlight one or two resources. For those of you who are interested, there is a European Union Geriatric Medicine Society, which is eugms.org org and hopefully we can put that on the Twitter hashtag and there is also an international association of gerontology and geriatrics iagg.info uh, and they really help connect international communities um, of practice because I've very much been dealing with coronavirus challenges for the past few months towards the end um, of my talk, I will talk about COVID a little bit and what we've learned so far. So I'm hoping my slides will now advance me. There we go. So this graphic, oh, hold on. I need to go back one. This graphic is from a big paper from 2014 by the King's Fund, where I am a visiting fellow. And it was a paper called Making Health and Care Systems Fit for an Aging Population. Um, it's a manual of how to organize systems of care and I'm just showing this graphic briefly with the patient at the center to illustrate just what Martin was saying that hospital care sits in a wider ecosystem a wider system of care starting with number one there which is helping people age well and stay well you know, public health interventions prevention then when people do acquire long-term medical conditions, helping them to live well with those conditions, uh, including things like dementia, uh, frailty, etc. Then you have those people who've got multiple conditions and frailty. Now, I haven't spoken about frailty specifically in this talk, but when we talk about frailty, we are talking about older people, sometimes people in midlife who have little in reserve, they may walk slowly, they may have muscle weakness, they're vulnerable to stressors. So even a minor illness in a frail older person can cause them to decompensate very rapidly and they'll present to acute care systems with problems like falls or acute confusion or immobility in a way that non-frail younger people do not. And when that happens, if you look at number four there, what, what I've said is accessible support in crisis. So when things are going wrong and they're going wrong quickly, people need somewhere to turn. And if they don't, they will default to acute hospital, to emergency rooms um, and so forth. So there is an in interest in rapid response in people's own homes or rapid access to ambulatory um, clinics, either at the acute hospital or in the community, for people who are entering crisis so they can avoid being sucked into the acute care system which is obviously not always the best place for them but we can do all of those things 
And we still need what's in number five there, which is high quality acute care for those older people who do need to come in. If you break your hip, if you have an acute stroke, if you have severe sepsis, you will need a period of acute hospital care. And often the issue is people stay too long once you've admitted them, uh, which is why number six there is about good discharge planning. So once we're over the acute phase of illness, planning for that care transition, what we need to do is to support people in the community. And because frail people will lose function in the face of acute illness or injury, rehabilitation becomes a core part of um, post-acute care. So that's number seven. Uh, hold on a minute. I need to go back one. Um, and of course, rehabilitation should start on day one. It shouldn't be something that we wait to happen until the person has moved to a, a different care setting. Number eight there, when we talk about long-term care, every system in Europe has something called nursing or residential homes or long-term care facilities. And there are debates about whether more people could remain in their own homes or age-friendly housing. But those residents in care homes have complex multiple health care needs and they often get uh, poor support from health services. And across uh, many European countries, including the UK and in North America, there have been big problems during COVID with people dying in large numbers in care homes, partly because of transfers from hospital. And the final thing there is end of life care. And of course, people can die in their own homes or care homes or hospitals, but we have to get that right. And what's wrapped around all those components is an overall aspiration to shift the curve a bit, to invest more in prevention and well-being. And if I move on, um, there are, of course, as outlined in that uh, graphic, many alternatives to hospital. We've talked about prevention, care planning, but also we can do more home-based rehabilitation what we refer to as intermediate care in the UK is short term, time limited uh, rehabilitation, either in people's discharge to assess schemes where you get people straight back to their own environment and assess their function in their own home instead of within hospital. Crisis response and palliative care we've talked about. I think increasingly advanced care planning. Uh, for end of life care is going to be important and certainly in the UK we don't do enough of that for enough people which means that when they arrive in hospital in crisis we're often having discussions with them about things like resuscitation or intensive care and in the media in the UK and I know in other European countries there have been big stories about uh, older people being uh, discussed about resuscitation about intensive care about ventilation and they've never had those discussions before they arrived in acute care. Hospital at home models can, can work. And there's growing interest in, in Britain about enhanced healthcare support in care homes. And I know, for instance, that colleagues in the Netherlands have a model of geriatricians working very closely within care homes, because if we get the healthcare for those residents right, many of them will not need to come into hospital. And there's growing interest in other things like uh, telehealth and telecare solutions, age-friendly housing. But you can do all of those things, um, just waiting for my slide to advance, you can do all of those things and it does not mean that hospitals are not um, required. England has about 2.6 beds per thousand population, which is very low down the league table, much lower than the EU average. Um, and e even though we have had a systematic policy of cutting hospital beds, we still have admissions that really can't be handled anywhere else. And there are big reviews of the evidence by the uh, showing that although those alternatives outside hospital can work well, but admissions are allowed to reduce um, uh, hospital capacity. And that's a big lesson really if we're planning hospitals for the future. Um, we should not make over optimistic assumptions about how few beds we will need in the future because people will need to come in. Conversely, there is a big evidence base around the benefits of comprehensive geriatric assessment. If you do that in a hospital ward, specialty led, team based, people are more likely to be alive and in their own home uh, a year after leaving hospital on average. And that's pretty much what's worked in 
shared care for people with hip fractures, whose median age is 85, and uh, on stroke units as well. So it's important. So Professor Rowan Harwood, who's a professor of geriatric medicine at um, Nottingham, sorry, I'm just waiting for the slide to come back. He wrote a great blog recently for British Geriatric Society about what we've learned from the COVID pandemic. Um, and he said, we need to stop demonizing hospital care. My slides disappeared again. Right, it's not, neither necessarily futile nor burdensome. Hospital admissions are driven by crises, change in functions or behavior, where assessment can only be delivered in the hospital setting. We invest a lot of effort in ensuring people manage close to term if that's possible, but it's not always possible for a variety of reasons. And I think at the moment, certainly in the UK, there's a narrative, a policy narrative, that hospital is always the wrong thing for older people, whereas in fact it can be the right thing in some cases. Um, Ken Rockwood, possibly the most influential geriatrician and frailty expert in the world in Canada, said if we design services for people with one thing wrong at once but people with many things wrong turn up the fault lies not with the users but with the system and mary mcmurdo who is professor in dundee said we need to make hospitals fit for the people who increasingly use them which is older people what other industry would label its biggest group of customers as a problem and propose to deal with it by keeping them away and there is quite a lot of that thinking at the moment not just in the uk but more widely so it's about the right person in the right bed at the right time Martin McKee alluded to changes in hospital case mix. Now, these data I'm showing you are from the acute uh, frailty clinical network um, and from my King's Fund paper, but they would apply more or less in other developed nations. These days, 60% of admissions are in people over 65, around a quarter of all bed days in people over 80. It is normal for people to have multiple life-limiting long-term conditions. I've just done a big ward round and every patient I saw had at least five, six, seven long-term medical conditions. Give or take around 40% of deaths happen in hospital and in the UK we know that one in three people who are in hospital bed right now are in the last 12 months of their life. They don't always know it but that's the reality. Polypharmacy comes with the multiple conditions and geriatricians spend a lot of our time rationalizing medications and frailty, sometimes people talk about atypical presentations, but they're not atypical, they're typical for people who are frail. So older people in the face of acute um, illness will fall over, they'll become immobile, they'll become delirious or incontinent, or they'll just not be thriving, not be managing well at home. But that usually has reversible medical causes. Dementia is a big issue. Um, if you look at the OECD projections, dementia prevalence is going to double over the next 20, 25 years across European countries. Currently, one in four people in a UK hospital, one in four adults has dementia. 40% of people admitted who are over 75 have dementia. And about half of those have not been diagnosed before they come in. Delirium, acute confusion, um, is about one in six beds. And normal case mix in hospital, people also have age-related functional impairment, disability, sensory impairment, and they're very frequently reliant on informal family caregivers, many of whom are all themselves. And those family caregivers often receive poor support. So this is very different. I, I qualified in the late 1980s. At the start of my career, this was not the typical case mix in hospital. It was often people in midlife with single conditions. Um, and we also have large numbers of people being admitted acutely from um, care homes. So that's modern hospital case mix for many adults. Um, comprehensive geriatric assessment. If you're interested, there are Cochrane reviews of this as a technology demonstrating across numerous countries and RCTs that it works. But it's a multidisciplinary diagnostic and treatment process to identify medical, psychological, functional capabilities of older adults to prevent a, a coordinated plan. So it's not just about dealing with the acute medical condition, but that wider holistic approach. And it needs skilled uh, practitioners and ease multidisciplinary teams to do well. Um, and by identifying reversible problems and reversing them and developing a long-term plan, 
outcomes are improved. And that's what geriatricians do more than probably anything else in terms of our distinct uh, offer. These guidelines reflect chapter four in the book, which I was one of the um, authors of. This is from the Health Improvement Scotland group, We've done a lot of work on improving care in hospital for older people. Now, I don't know how well that reads on the projection, but it's 16 standards of care. Uh, that's better. It's involving older people because it's very easy to institutionalize people. What's important to you? Where would you like to go next? What are your goals? Dignity and privacy come up repeatedly in complaints about poor care for older people. So things like continence and nutrition and clothing really matter. Lots of people do have impaired mental capacity, so we have to get decision making right, but often we have to act in people's best interests. And many European countries have some formulation of a mental capacity uh, legislation. Assessing people close to the front door, in, in my own hospital and across a lot of uh, hospitals in the UK now, we've got people like geriatricians, occupational therapists working seven days a week to find all those older people with frailty and see them as early as possible and hopefully get them home as quickly as possible before they get admitted to a deeper ward. CGA we've talked about rationalizing medications but also avoiding reconciliation problems and problems with medicines when people leave hospital. Uh, iatrogenesis is frequently implicated in things like readmissions. Um, with delirium and dementia and cognitive impairment this is now core business. So everyone needs some skill in assessing people with uh, dementia and we need to make the ward environment uh, more fit for people with dementia. Depression and other um, mental health problems often accompany long-term conditions. Uh, and I've mentioned fall prevention management there. Falls are the biggest safety incident affecting hospital inpatients and they're largely in frail people. But if you think about it, some of the other safety problems like pressure sores, poor nutrition, hospital acquired infection um, affect older people more than other groups. And then we've said that rehabilitation and discharge planning and care transitions, including support post discharge are really core business. If you don't invest in that, it will lose function and they will decondition in hospital getting stuck in bed. And we know if you look at the data, something like 15% of people over 80 will be readmitted to hospital within the first month. So that transitional care is important. And patient pathway and flow I've, I've mentioned is about minimizing delays either within hospital processes or in accessing external support because we don't want people being stranded in hospital waiting for things to happen when we're adding no value to their care and we're putting them at risk. Uh, and that's increasingly important business. I, everything I've mentioned so far has been about acute care but Martin alluded to joint models of surgical care. Um, there's been a lot of success with shared care for acute trauma older patients, people with hip fractures, which has improved outcomes. But increasingly now, um, there's a movement around proactive care for older people's surgery, where you have shared care between physicians, geriatricians, anaesthetists and surgeons to actually get people on the right pathway early on. And in fact, the Royal College of Anaesthetists in um, the UK now has a centre for perioperative medicine, focusing on that joined up um, care between disciplines for people with complex multimorbidity. And um, the other aspect of planned care, and I think COVID-19, certainly in Britain, has really focused on this, is outpatients, is clinic work. The Royal College of Physicians, where I was the Vice President, had a, a report called Outpatients the Future in 2018. And one thing they described was that something like one in five cars on the road are taking someone to a hospital clinic. Um, and people spend a lot of time going up and down from the hospital, uh, often for a 10 or 15 minute appointment. The Richmond Group, which is a big group of health charities, um, Set, describe people with multi-morbidity seeing multiple specialists in multiple clinics and I think what we need to move away from is constantly bringing people up to the physical estate of the hospital and focusing more on remote consulting which we've done much of in COVID and patient directed consultation. I can see a message there from the organizers saying we're running late so you must tell me if you need me to stop. Um, this is just about barriers and enablers and the main thing to say is the workforce is key to getting all of this right. 
You need enough specialist geriatricians. Uh, you need enough specialist uh, therapists and nurse practitioners, but we also need enough people in those out of hospital services to have that whole systems approach. But we also need other specialists to have sufficient generalist skills that they're reasonably competent dealing with people who are frail. Because if you're a nephrologist or a respiratory physician or an emergency physician, you will be dealing with people with problems like frailty or dementia. So we need more expert generalism, we need more specialists who have um, generalist skills and um, workforce planning and education therefore really matter. We've not probably training the workforce that people are going to be dealing with uh, at the moment. Um, and I think also we need more prioritization of research in for older people, including in systems of care, people with multimorbidity and pragmatic improvement science. And certainly if we're gonna have this joined up care working, we need better informatics, more shared care records, et cetera. Now, I do have a couple of things about COVID, but it, it, as I say, if the organizers want to gain some time back, I can not talk about it if you want. You only have to speak up and let me know. Uh, if you're interested in COVID in older people, there have been two big reviews in age and aging in May. One was a rapid clinical review about older people and COVID. The other one was a commentary about the challenge of COVID in care homes, which could apply in care homes across Europe. And if you um, go to the British Geriatric Society website, it's had a load of COVID-19 um, resources. And two blogs I will draw your attention to, they're all free. One is from Rowan Harwood, did the UK response to COVID-19 pandemic fail frail older people? And I think many countries will be asking that. And the second one from Sheila O'Riordan, who's a geriatrician working in the community, is about improving joined up services for people with frailty, looking at what we need to do outside hospital. Um, the challenges specifically of COVID, testing is a big problem, as you know, very high false and first negative rate. And we've been finding many frail older people with no symptoms, both in hospital and in care homes, who are testing positive. There's been a huge issue about transfer between settings, about people leaving hospital and taking the COVID into a family home or into a care home. So what should we be doing about testing people before they transfer and some quarantining? Do we have the capacity to quarantine people? We now know about long COVID. We've had lots of people with symptoms that go on for weeks, fit young people, but older people as well. And crucially, whilst we started off talking about COVID as a respiratory problem, for older people, often they present with other issues. They present delirious or with gastrointestinal upset or with immobility or falls, with poor nutrition, not thriving, and they're often unwell for weeks after leaving hospital. So it raises some issues about what is hospital really for? Is it only for people who uh, have those severe respiratory symptoms and need IV fluids and oxygen? And about with limited intensive care unit capacity, how we make decisions. It so happens that in the UK, we tripled intensive care bed capacity during the pandemic, and we didn't have to make really difficult rationing decisions. But there is an issue about who's likely to benefit from ventilation and whether we need more escalation plans around resuscitation. Um, only one more main slide to go. Um, we need accurate data, including data on deaths, which at the moment, um, they're not recorded in the same way in different European countries. There's a big piece of work for frail older people about public expectations. You can't save everyone. It's a nasty virus that hits people hard and some people will do badly and resuscitation or hospitalization isn't appropriate for everyone. The need to give good palliative care for people who are dying, from, especially from respiratory COVID. Family caregivers who are often older people themselves may be at risk. So there's a whole thing about how we protect them and have enough protective equipment for care workers. And I know that even in Germany, which has had an excellent response to coronavirus, there were still issues with PPE. Uh, there are a big load of issues about ethics and law about how we prioritise. And certainly in the UK, the feeling has been that we've possibly sacrificed older people who are frail and live in nursing homes to protect hospital beds for fitter younger people. Have we focused too much on the hospital and not on the wider system? And do we need to put more into research about older people with COVID? Um, I think that's it. I am, am on Twitter a lot uh, and uh, always happy to join in conversations. I write in the British Medical Journal every week. 
And if you email me, I'm quite happy to send links to resources uh, and slides. I'm very friendly, but thanks for listening. Thank you, David. Uh, we are running a bit late, but people are still there. And uh, we, we had some, uh, some questions which have already been addressed individually. Uh, but Martin, do you want to have a, have a reflection on those questions? Maybe especially, I mean, some taking some of the questions. Some of them we will be addressing also in in later sessions of of the summer school. But 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 maybe you, I mean, um, maybe you take over and say, I mean, what which, which questions did you find particularly interesting? And and maybe you could uh, reflect a bit a bit more on them. Sure, and really th uh, thanks also to David. I think what has become clear is that if we had, if we were writing our book now, we would write it in a different way, because the past few months have really changed the way where we need to work in a number of ways. Um, first of all, as David has said, the patients that he's treating um, are very different from the patients that I was treating when I was in a hospital medicine a very long time ago. And I qualified before David did. And, um, uh, but this is particularly true of COVID. One of the things we've realized in a, a paper that we published uh, a little while back, which I did with colleagues in cardiology and intensive care and respiratory medicine and so on, was uh, talking about COVID as a complex multi-system disease. And as David said, this was initially treated like a viral pneumonia, like any other viral pneumonia. And you, you ventilate people, they get better, hopefully, or they die. But now we realize that this is a systemic disease with the coronavirus attacking the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessels, the cardiovascular system, the neurological system, even in an increasing number of cases, knocking out the islet cells in the pancreas, leading to an onset, onset of type 1 diabetes in older people. So this is calling for a model of care that is integrated with different specialties working together. Now that works better or worse in different countries. But I think what we are going to see is a, an imperative to improve the working across silos. Earlier on this morning on a European, uh, I'm on the European Commission's expert panel on health, um, which was mentioned earlier in respect to task shifting. And we were discussing the challenges that there are in getting the specialty associations within countries and at a European level to talk to one another. It's not clear that we've got the mechanisms for the cardiologists and the respiratory physicians and the anaesthetists all to communicate with one another as well as we might be. And then another person mentioned telemedicine. Well, clearly we're already doing a lot of that. Um, I think all of us are going to do, be doing much more online now that has consequences because I, like many of you, am spending 10 to 12 hours a day on day. And that, that has you know, serious implications for our, our sanity apart from anything else. But also I think we're understanding much more. A piece in the British Medical Journal this week was dealing with the practical issues around retention of data images and confidentiality and so on. But let's be honest, for many patients, it's far more convenient to have a Zoom appointment than go to a hospital to have a conversation uh, with a, a physician for, or a nurse for a follow-up. So I think that we're going to see the, the points that we were making in the book was that we need team working, we need better communication, we need patient engagement with the patients as partners. All of those have been demonstrated to be even more important post-COVID than they were. So I don't know, would David like to maybe follow up on that? Uh, am I answering a question though, Martin, or a... No, I mean... Well, about how, well, I think what COVID has accelerated some innovations that we were wanting to do anyway, hasn't it? So, for instance, the use of more um, uh, telemonitoring at home, more hospital at home, um, more supportive discharge, more remote consulting, you know, changes in the outpatient model. So I think some of those things we've learned during the pandemic uh, need to be sustained. For me, it's really highlighted the need for better support for care homes. In the UK, there are three times as many people living in nursing residential homes as there are in hospital. It's highlighted the need for more advanced care planning so that we don't end up making difficult decisions when people presenting uh, in crisis, for instance. 
Um, so I think it's in every country there'll be a slightly different mashup, but I think it's exposed some system weaknesses. But it's also been a great uh, innovation accelerator. I'll just give you one quick example where I work. We've now got a virtual ward where we've managed two or three hundred people in their own homes with pulse oximetry and remote monitoring uh, and able to keep them out of hospital that way. So that's the kind of facility you want to be able to keep when the, when the pandemic's um, over. It's highlighted the need for more post-intensive care unit rehab, for instance. Um, and if you read Nigel Edwards's um, piece for the Nuffield Trust in the UK about if we build more hospitals, what should we do? That's really important. Yeah. That we need hospitals better for infection control and isolation. We need hospitals with more spare capacity in cases of pandemic surge, uh, more flexible uh, spaces. And we need to think about bed numbers in the that system context um, because otherwise what we build now will already be, not be fit for purpose in in 10 years time so I think there is some there is some learning there that can embed help embed system change yeah we're very much trying to pull that together in the report we're doing for the European Commission at the minute exactly that and Nigel's report was very helpful this point about needing to have somewhere <laughs> patients can step down from intensive care units and also building in uh, as Reinhardt knows we often have these discussions about hospital capacity um, and it's a British or an Irish discussion largely because in Germany it's not even a discussion because there's just <laughs> so much of it so you know people say well what are you actually talking about but I think there are other things beyond beds because things like oxygen capacity for example yeah we've had hospitals that have been running out of oxygen uh, and uh, you know these are things that can be put in place relatively easily and they don't have much marginal maintenance costs but your point also as you say about having places opportunities to step down from intensive care because it's that discontinuity we know when patients move and particularly from your area um, moving patients is often problematic um, and in particular, the work that Linda Aiken and others have been doing, a failure to recognize, a failure to rescue, you know, people go off because the, nobody picks them up and you don't have, they're, they're, they're dealt with an intensive care and then they just go into a void somewhere. But as you say, uh, I, think, I think, yeah, sorry. And another thing that's happened certainly in the UK context is that most of the successful innovation has been driven by local clinical leaders, local managers. It's not come from central government agencies. And what's been remarkable is in the face of the pandemic, how quickly people have changed service models when they, when they had to. For instance, we had a problem with older people being stuck in hospital waiting for rehabilitation, waiting for social care, and we cut through all that very quickly. So I think there's certainly a case for more of a focus on clinically led improvement and innovation at, at that local uh, level and leave uh, regional or national government bodies for the big things like testing capacity and protective equipment. David, that's already an advertisement on issues which we will be addressing next week. We have a session both Excellent. on the on the on the two on, on the Monday we start. But there's also a question here on the general size of the hospitals because yeah. in many in many countries people now say especially in my country where we have many, many hospitals, even more beds. Some people now have the feeling that these many beds saved us, not seeing that at maximum 2% of the beds were used for COVID patients and 98% of the hospital beds were not used for the COVID uh -huh. patients because we didn't have as many patients there and we managed to keep patients out of the hospitals. But we will be looking at the uh, clinician-driven innovations like you, you mentioned on, on the Tuesday of next week and then also networking of hospitals uh, Wednesday. I mean, the idea is obviously, and we have people already speaking with much of experience on the COVID crisis this week, and it's yeah. totally pertinent that people ask questions, but, but you know, this is only the first, uh, the first yeah. day. Um, I hope that the people who have addressed questions to us, many of which we have answered in individually, there are a few open, Martin. I don't know whether you want to take them. We have one on 
on the local national culture, whether that influences uh, the, the, the hospitals and one, but we also come back on that, the, you know, how the, the general number of specializations in hospitals has changed. I thought that, they, or maybe David, you can take that as a geriatrician. I mean, geriatrics, you could say is one specialty, but clearly as a geriatrician, you're also dependent on other specialties. Well, so. Well. Well, okay. I think I think the answer the, there's the whole business about generalism versus specialism, which is an international thing. And I would say that people like GPs, obviously family medicine, emergency medicine, uh, internal medicine, geriatric medicine, we're expert generalists. So we have a good broad training, and we can deal confidently with people with multiple problems simultaneously. So we are specialists in generalism, and we're specialists in systems of care. But even in the UK, where geriatrics is the single biggest internal medicine specialty, we can't look after everybody. So you, so you also need to make sure that your single disease specialists have some good generalist skills. If you are a respiratory physician, let's say, or a gastroenterologist, you should be able to deal fairly confidently with the other four or five morbidities. You shouldn't be scared because someone's 85 and frail and has dementia. I would be ashamed if I couldn't manage acute kidney injury semi-competently, and I'm not a nephrologist, so I would expect other people to be able to manage some things like falls or confusion better. So I think geriatric medicine has to be part of people's uh, general training, but it's not just about doctors. So much of what we do relies on teams, and I can't do my job without really good skilled occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech therapists, uh, nurse practitioners so we have to think about what skills the multidisciplinary team has and some of those skills might be flexible within that team and i think that would be crucial to workforce planning yeah can i just say i'm conscious that some of us have to go on to another call i know Joseph oh, yeah. and myself uh, and uh, but so can I can I just add, Reinhardt, one, one thing that to really emphasize one of the things in, in doing our book, I was absolutely convinced as somebody who was a clinician many, many years ago, that we really need to bridge this gap between clinicians and policymakers. And actually, it was quite a struggle persuading people we should do this. It really is like two tribes that don't talk to one another. And I'm really grateful to David and to a number of others for contributing to the book, because it was not easy finding authors. It was not easy finding people, and, and we are a bit dominant by, dominant, dominated in the book by the UK. Um, and I think that's perhaps, and people who know me will know how critical I am of what goes on in England in many ways. But that is, I think, one area where there is more of that dialogue than in a lot of other countries. And I think we really need to see that happen uh, much more, because otherwise we've got policy discussions about hospitals without any real knowledge of what's going on yeah. inside them, and yeah. clinicians moaning that nobody understands them without really making the effort to get somebody. So bringing them together is sort of um, one of my com life commitments, um, and I, I think we've started a process, but it's only just starting a process, and there's so much more to do. Yes, thank you, Martin. I think with that, we should close today's session. I mean, we will have more. We come back to many of these issues. In the summer school, we have lecturers also from other countries. We have the Netherlands, we have Spain, we have Germany represented. So I hope that we, to, to the audience, which is now leaving us anyway, so I don't want to block anybody's diary and any more thank you david for for presenting thank you audience and hope to see you back tomorrow and over the next days bye 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 bye